shepherds watch their flocks by night and see this baby wrapped in light a host of angels led them all to you it was just as the angels said you find a Welcome, everybody, to Napa Valley Life Christmas Eve service. We're so excited that you're joining us to reflect on the, the birth of Jesus Christ and the joy that brings to our world. If this is your first time joining us, we'd love to hear from you. And below this video in the links, there's a Connect card where you can tell us more about yourself and a prayer card where you can ask for prayer so that we can be thinking of you beyond the Sunday morning context. We'd love to hear from you and uh, that is a great way to do it. We are gonna be taking a missions offering specially for the holiday season for our international missionaries. So if you are interested in do that, you can go to nvlife.org slash give uh, and we'd love to be able to bless the families of the missionaries that are going out and preaching the gospel in the entire world. Additionally, we're really excited about our next sermon series, which is called Questions and Answers. And here's a promo for that. All right, now's the time to join in together and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ.
Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Shepherds kept their watching Or silent box by night Christmas story began long ago, before the angel told Mary she would have God's son, before shepherds saw the angels and wise men saw the star. God had a plan for Christmas. From the beginning of time, God's plan was Jesus. Count the stars, God told Abraham. That's how many children will come from your family. When Abraham and Sarah were very old, God gave them a baby boy named Isaac. Then Isaac had a son, and Isaac's son had a son, until Abraham's family grew all the way to Jesus. God's prophets talked about the Savior who would come into the world to save everyone who believes in Him. Everything happened just like they said it would. God's ways and timing are always perfect. God picked just the right time for Jesus to come to earth, and he picked just the right parents for him. An angel appeared to a young girl named Mary. Don't be afraid, Mary, said God's angel Gabriel. Soon you will have a baby boy. His name will be Jesus. Nothing is impossible for God. An angel of the Lord appeared to Mary's fiance, Joseph, in a dream, Joseph, the angel said, Don't be afraid. The baby is from the Holy Spirit. Name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph woke up, he did just what the angel commanded. Mary's cousin Elizabeth was very old when an angel told her husband, Zachariah, that they would have a son and they were to name him John. John spent his entire life showing people that the only person could forgive them of their sin and take them to heaven. That person was Jesus. Just before Mary was about to have her baby, Joseph had to travel to his hometown, Bethlehem. But there were no rooms left for them. In a stable where the animals were kept, Mary's baby, God's son, was born. In the stillness of the night, he came. God's gift of Christmas, the one who would save the world. In nearby fields, shepherds were watching over their flocks. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord was shining around them. Do not be afraid, the angel said. I bring good news that will be 
great joy for all people. Today in Bethlehem, the city of David, the Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, Christ the Lord. Wise men from the east followed a bright star. The star led the wise men to Jesus, and they were filled with great joy. We have come to worship your son, they told Mary. They presented their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and worshiped him. This Christmas, remember that God loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus to the world so he could spend forever with you. God loves you more than you know. God's glorious gift for Christmas is for you.
Merry Christmas from Napa Valley Life Church. We are so glad that you're joining us this evening in a strange COVID Christmas. But guess what? We still get to celebrate that Jesus was born 2,000 some odd years ago. 
You know, throughout this Christmas season, we've been looking at how Jesus, the first interactions of Jesus with people, it changed them. How it moved them to follow him, how it completely just reoriented their life. And we're calling it the Christmas Effect series. And so today, appropriately tonight, we're going to look at how Jesus changes us. How he, he makes us essentially somebody different, a different person. And look, we talk about this at church a lot, about how Christ changes us. I think you guys, if you've ever been to church, you've heard these words before, things along the lines that he comes to take away our sins, he regenerates new life in us, that we are born again, that now we're aligned to serve God, and all of these are fundamentally true, and a peace and an attribute, and to, it's all to the glory of God. It is wonderful that it happens. But today we're looking at how Jesus changes us relationally with God. Because when we become Christians, our relationship with God fundamentally changes. And it even goes a little bit further than salvation. And it's wonderful that we have a God that loves us so dearly that it would be willing to change our relationship in that level. So if you have your Bibles, open to Galatians 4. And in verse 4 it says this, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. The arrival of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And most importantly, it changes our relationship with God. See, God does not just save us. He adopts us. He makes us his children. We're not just an unwanted people that God reluctantly saved because he felt bad for. Oh, those stupid sinners. I just need to send something to take care of them. No. Instead, we are now part of God's fa family. We are adopted as sons and daughters. And adoption comes with the full rights and privileges of being children of God. So tonight, that's what we're looking at. Our Christmas adoption. And how wonderful it is. So let's look at two quick points about our Christmas adoption in light of Galatians 4. Our Christmas adoption, number one, is from God. Now, you're probably thinking, yes, obviously, the adoption is from God. A parent, uh, the adoption of a child has to come from the parent, correct? That's how it initiates. But look at this further in verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come... God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Of course, our adoption is from God. But we need to understand a few things about this adoption before we go forward. Number one, Jesus was plan A in this adoption. Jesus was plan B. It was not at a point where God was saying, oh, we need to figure out something for these sinners. And then a couple thousand years later, he said, wait, I have an idea. I'm going I'm to send my son to earth to die for him. That's not how our salvation works. Instead, this was plan A, be, planned from the beginning of time. Look what it says in Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, Scripture points to us throughout that this was plan A. And when the time was right, meaning that everything worked together, sovereignly God placed it together politically, strategically, relationally. The, Israel, the people of Israelites, all the Israelites at the right time, God sent Jesus to die for us. This was not a mistake. It was the plan. A couple years ago, I took my family. I was looking through places to take my family. It was winter in Arizona, so we said, hey, we want to go for a, just a quick ride on a Saturday. And so I found this place called Crown King. And I told my wife, I said, hey, let's go to Crown King. Uh, I know it's about an hour off of the main highway, and it's supposed to be this little paradise city. And she goes, okay, let's do it. And so my pregnant wife gets in my truck. My four-year-old child gets in my truck, and we drive 
We go up the highway and we get off of the road. And as we're driving off of this road, about a mile down, the, the uh, paved road, the tarmac or whatever it was, turns into dirt. And I look at my wife and she looks at me and says, it's okay. I trust you, right? This is your plan. And then as we start going further, the two lanes turn into one lane. And then as we get further, we're now crawling up this mountain that's only about a foot wider than my truck is. And I remember looking at my wife and her, I I think she had faith that I wasn't going to kill us, but she definitely was hesitant. And her looking at me going, what did you get me into? And I said to her, this is the plan all along. Trust me, I know where I'm getting. Now the truth was, I had no idea what I was doing. And sooner or later, we got to Crown King, and it was incredible, but I was just as terrified as she, my pregnant wife, was. And see, this does not relate to God's plan. At no point in time did he say, "Uh uh-oh, they're becoming too much of sinners. I don't know if I could save them. Uh Uh-oh, things are getting a little out of hand here. No, God's sovereignty shows us that this was the plan all along. It says in 2 Timothy 1.9, which he gave in us, or us in Christ Jesus, Before the ages began, he knew that Jesus was coming to redeem you. He knew that you were going to be adopted in. The fullness of time had come. And when the time was perfect, when the world was ready, God sent his son, born of a woman, meaning that he was fully man and fully God. And if that's confusing to you, I understand. But take it like this. Our God knows all of the emotions you carry with you, the struggles you carry with you, the temptations you carry with you, the pain and the hurt and the suffering that you carry with you. Our God has endured it all. Fully man and fully God. And he came to this world, and although he was tempted with everything, did not sin. He was born under the law, meaning that the law shows us that we are not righteous. God said, this is the standard, and we understand that we can never meet it. Yet one person did. The fully God, fully man, Jesus Christ, met the expectation for righteousness. But he lived under the law like we did. He just didn't sin. And then he endured death. See, our sin causes death. It's the punishment for sin. And Jesus takes that death on the cross for us. And then he resurrects to defeat death. This was all from God. This is all in his plan. He did this for you. But it starts with him. And look, the truth is, he did not have to. Justice shows us that he could have just had us endure our punishment and then wipe the floor with us but he didn't. His grace is this meeting of justice and mercy that we are saved and now we can be adopted. Why? Well, because our Christmas adoption starts with God, but we need to recognize that it is for us. That it is for us. Verse 5, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Now, I'm hesitant to say that it is for us because often we take the idea that it is for us like God is saying, you're okay just how you are and all your flaws and and your sin and that time you yelled at your wife or your kids or you got mad at the job or all that stuff. You know what? God just loves you how you are. That's not what Christmas tells us. That's not what our Christmas adoption tells us. Instead, Christ's arrival tells us the exact opposite of that. He comes because we were under the law, meaning that God showed us the standard of righteousness, like I said a second ago, and he exceeded it, but we could not get anywhere near meeting it. So Jesus comes to be our righteousness because we cannot be righteous alone to save us from our punishment of sin, which is death. So Christmas tells us that you are not okay, but instead you are in desperate need. And so God provides a need because he so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. This is Christmas adoption. And verse 5 says that we are now adopted as sons. 
Salvation is wonderful. It's the cornerstone to what we believe that we, we need to be saved. But adoption takes it one step further. Because adoption is not a halfway experience. David Platt, who adopted many children, said it like this, that adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, higher even than justification or salvation. Those two words mean the same here. J.I. Packer says it like this, but this is not to say that justification is the highest blessing of the gospel. Adoption is higher because of richer relationship that God or with God that it involves. Adoption is higher than even salvation because he's not just saying, look, I'm going to save them and then not deal with them anymore. No, God says, I'm going to save them and then adopt them into my family. I want them with me. I want them to have the privileges of being a child of God. He could have just saved us and just left us, but instead he saves us and adopts us. Romans 8 affirms this when it says this, For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, listen to this, Abba, Father. We can cry out to our Lord, Father. We don't deserve that, church. This is adoption. Church, visitors, adoption comes with the full rights and privileges of any biological child. There is no distinction between biological and adopted. There is none now, and there was not none that, any then. There is no distinction. We're adopted. Full rights and privileges. And if you call on the name of Jesus, you are adopted completely. Oh, what a Christmas adoption. Isn't it wonderful? So often we see Christmas as the celebration of a little baby born in a manger. That's what it is, obviously. And if you're a Christian, you know that that, is, that baby is so much more than just that baby born in the manger. So much more than just a story about a family that couldn't find a hotel room. But instead, it's a story of God becoming, becoming incarnate into this world. Fully man, fully God. But because of that, because of the life that he led and the death that he endured and the resurrection that he came through, we can now be adopted children of God. Let's look at what the adoption process, as we come to the end here, let's look at what the adoption process looks like. At some point in time through the adoption process, this takes place. The final stage, as a matter of fact, and I know many people who've gone through this process. And so what they do is they stand in court on that final day. They show that they've met the requirements for the adoptions, meaning that they've been trained, that they've had home visits, that they have all the ability to adopt. They don't want these children going to homes where they shouldn't be placed or they shouldn't be adopted into. I had one friend that told me that in his adoption process, he knew exactly how far the hospital was from his house, 0.6 miles. Why? Because that's what he needed to know to get the adoption to go through. And then finally, in the adoption process, it has to be approved by the judge. And when he strikes his gavel, or she strikes her gavel, or whatever happens in that process, at that point in time, that child receives their final name. They're eternally changed. Why? Because they're brought into that family. Their identity is different. Yes, the history and everything else comes with them. And they're a unique child of God. But their identity is eternally changed. Church, this is what Jesus has done for us. He stood before the Father in the court systems of the court that would look at you and say, you are guilty and deserving of death. Jesus st stood in that courtroom beside you. He showed and, and he met all the requirements for salvation, being the perfect sacrifice to atone for our sins. He met that requirement. So he stands with us, not only saying that he wants to bring us in, but he says, look, I can meet the requirements of their punishment. And then finally, he's approved by the judge, the perfect judge. 
And now we carry his name. Eternally changed. We are adopted children of God. So as we know this adoption is real, let's finish today with reading the story of this birth. Luke 2, verses 7 through 14 says this, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. Because there was no place for them at the inn. And in the same region where the shepherds are, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field watching over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not. For behold, I bring good news of great joy that will be here for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, listen to this, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those whom he is pleased. We are adopted, church. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your salvation. And even more so for your adoption. That you didn't send your son off of a oh no last minute idea. But instead from the beginning of time you said that you were going to redeem us. And that in that redemption, we would not just be saved, we would be adopted. Lord, we just thank you for that adoption. We thank you that we can be in your family with you. And as we celebrate Christmas today, let us not forget the purpose of Christmas. Those adoption papers were being put together and signed. Lord, we thank you. As you guys are praying, this is a great time. As a family, maybe you're at home to thank God for sending his son. You've never done that before. This is a great time. Or maybe you're at home or with your kids and they're saying, hey, I want to be adopted. I want to know who Jesus is. I want to know what it is to be a child of God. And if that's the case, it's time to pray. Romans is clear. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. That promise is for you too. And not only saved, we will be adopted. Call out to God and say, hey, we're sinners in need of a Savior. And we know that Jesus is the only one. Let this Christmas adoption be different than any other Christmas. Lord, we praise you and worship you. And we thank you for your good grace, your precious and holy name. Amen.
Jesus.